Backtracks roasting on an open fire. Spotlight albums up your nose. Oh, wait a minute. Greetings, one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, it is time for Backtracks once again. Not only the last Backtracks of 2019, but the last of the 2010s. Can you believe it? The decade is just a couple weeks away from being over. It just kind of blows the mind, doesn't it? Anyway, yes, uh, Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, with at least one Spotlight album. And so let's just not waste any more time here. Let's plunge headlong and let slip the dogs of war and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for this final month of the year and of the decade. Six decades ago this month, Bill Haley and his Comets released their ninth album, Strictly Instrumental. It was their last album released on the DECA label and their last produced by Milt Gabler. Recorded in sessions over a 15 month span, the album produced two chart hits, Joey's Song, which reached number 46 on the Billboard 200 and number 26 on the Canadian charts, and Skokian, which charted at number 70 on the Billboard 200 and was their final single to chart in the US. The album also includes renditions of Mac the Knife and Music Music Music. Three different bassists were heard playing on the album, all of whom coincidentally shared the first name of Al. Also released in December of 1959 was the landmark jazz album Time Out by the Dave Brubeck Quartet. Although it was initially received negatively by critics, it went on to peak at number two on the Billboard Albums chart, and it became the first jazz album to sell more than one million copies, achieving platinum certification in 1997. The album's seven tracks are notable for unconventional time signatures, never before heard in Western jazz recordings, which Brubeck was exposed to on a government-sponsored tour of Europe and Asia in 1958. The album's centerpiece was Take 5, which was released as a single three months earlier, but didn't reach its peak of number 25 on the Billboard 200 until a year and a half after the album was released. And honestly, this is an absolutely fantastic album. Even if you're not a jazz fan, it's an album that I think every person who calls themselves a music fan needs to hear. Listen to it if you haven't yet. Trust me. In December of 1964, the Kingston Trio released their self-titled 15th album, also known as Nick Bob John. It was their first release on the DECA label after a successful seven-year run on Capitol Records. It was also their first studio album to peak outside the top 20 of the Billboard Albums chart, reaching only number 53. Along with two singles, My Ramblin' Boy and I'm Goin' Home, the album features the trio's renditions of Midnight Special by Lead Belly and Bob Dylan's Farewell, Fare Thee Well. Also released 55 years ago this month was the Yardbirds debut album Five Live Yardbirds. Recorded live the previous March at London's Marquee Club, this album includes some of the earliest recordings ever of Eric Clapton. It consists entirely of tunes written by American rhythm and blues artists such as Bo Diddley's I'm a Man, Howlin' Wolf's Smokestack Lightning, and Chuck Berry's Too Much Monkey Business, this version of which Joe Perry cites as, quote, a blueprint for a lot of what Aerosmith tried to do. The album didn't chart in the UK and wasn't issued in the US, although four of its tracks w did appear on their second American album, Having a Rave Up. Celebrating its 50th anniversary this month is Oki from Muskogee, Merle Haggard and the Strangers' first live album, recorded during a performance at the Muskogee, Oklahoma Civic Center in October of 1969. The studio version of the title track was released the previous month and topped the Billboard Country Singles chart for four weeks and just missed the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 41. Along with his own hits, I'm a Lonesome Fugitive, Sing Me Back Home, and Workin' Man Blues, the album includes his interpretation of Buck Owens' In the Arms of Love. The album won Album of the Year awards from both the Country Music Association and the Academy of Country Music. December of 1969 also saw the release of the Jackson 5's debut album, Diana Ross Presents the Jackson 5. It spent nine weeks at the top spot on the Billboard R&B Albums chart and peaked at number five on the Billboard Pop Albums chart. Only one single was released from the album, but it was a big one. I Want You Back was their first of four consecutive number ones on the Billboard Hot 100 and sat at the number one spot on the Billboard Soul Singles chart for four weeks. The album title, incidentally, was purely for promotion's sake. Diana Ross does not appear on the album, nor did she even discover the Jackson 5. Family patriarch Joe credited Gladys Knight for first bringing them to the attention of Motown founder Barry Gordy. 45 years ago this month, Grand Funk Railroad released their ninth album, All the Girls in the World Beware. Produced by Jimmy Einer, who also worked with the Bay City Rollers, the Raspberries, and Three Dog Night, the album spent 24 weeks on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 10. 
it reached the top 20 of the Canadian Albums Chart. Lead-off single was a cover of Some Kind of Wonderful, which bested the original Soul Brothers 6 version's number 91 peak by climbing to number 3 on the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up single Bad Time was also a top 5 US hit. Both singles charted in the top 10 in Canada. Also released in December of 1974 was Joe Walsh's third album, So What? It earned a gold certification from the RIAA and peaked at number 11 on the Billboard Pop Albums chart. The album's only single, Turn to Stone, barely charted within the Billboard Hot 100 at number 93, but it does feature three quarters of the Eagles. Glenn Fry, Don Henley, and Randy Meissner perform backing vocals on that track, as well as Help Me Through the Night, with Henley singing backup on two additional songs and co-writing the album track Falling Down. Less than two years later, Walsh himself would join the Eagles in time for their landmark album, Hotel California. Four decades ago this month, Christopher Cross released his self-titled debut album. One of the first digitally recorded albums, it peaked at number six on the Billboard Pop Albums chart and currently enjoys five times platinum status in the US. And it also notoriously beat out Pink Floyd's The Wall to win Album of the Year at the 1981 Grammys. The album racked up four top 20 hits on the pop singles chart, Sailing hit number one, Ride Like the Wind reached number two, and Never Be the Same and Say You'll Be Mine also peaked inside the top 20. Michael McDonald and Don Henley provided backing vocals on the album. Also celebrating a very noteworthy 40th anniversary this month is London Calling, The Clash's third album. This now legendary album originally met with a mostly lukewarm reception on the charts. It was top 5 in Sweden and Norway, but it only peaked at number 9 in the UK, number 12 in Canada, and number 27 in the US. Although Rolling Stone does rank it number 8 on their list of the greatest albums of all time. The single release of the title track didn't chart in the US, but it reached number 11 on the UK charts. Train in Vain didn't chart in the UK, but it was a top 40 hit in the US. Both singles reached the top 40 in the New Zealand charts. The cover photo of Paul Simonon smashing his Fender Precision bass during a New York Palladium concert, out of frustration by the way for the staff not allowing the audience to stand up during the show, became one of the most iconic album covers of all time, and one of ten chosen by the Royal Mail in the UK for a series of commemorative postage stamps issued in 2010. 35 years ago this month, Foreigner released their fifth album, Agent Provocateur. It was the band's only album to reach number one in the UK. It also went number one in Norway, Germany, and Sweden, and peaked at number two in Australia, number three in Canada, and number four in the US. The album contains the band's biggest hit single, I Wanna Know What Love Is, which was Foreigner's only number one on the primary singles charts in the US and the UK. It spent five weeks at number one in Australia and topped the singles charts in six other countries, including Canada and Israel. It was also a top 10 single in several additional countries. The follow-up single, That Was Yesterday, was a top 20 hit in the US and a top 40 hit in Canada, the UK, and Germany. December of 1984 also saw the release of the soundtrack to the hit comedy action film Beverly Hills Cop. It spent more than a year on the Billboard 200 chart, but it took six months to reach the number one spot, a position it held for two weeks. It peaked at number six on the Billboard R&B Albums chart two months earlier. The movie's de facto theme song, Axel F by Harold Faltermeyer, was a worldwide top ten hit, reaching number one on the Canadian and U.S. adult contemporary charts, and number two in Belgium, the Netherlands, and the U.K. Glenn Frey's The Heat Is On peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and in Australia, and went top ten in Canada and Norway and Sweden. Patti LaBelle contributed two songs to the soundtrack, New Attitude was a top 20 hit on the Billboard Hot 100, and Stir It Up reached number 5 on the Billboard R&B singles chart. In December of 1989, Ella Fitzgerald released her final album, All That Jazz. After decades of recording contemporary pop songs, this album saw her come full circle back to the jazz standards that launched her career, including When Your Lover Has Gone, Dream a Little Dream of Me, The Nearness of You, and Good Morning Heartache. Ella's swan song earned her a Grammy for Best Female Jazz Vocal Performance. Also released 30 years ago this month was David Van Tegum's third album, Strange Cargo. Best known for his work with David Byrne and Talking Heads, Laurie Anderson, and the Duran Duran spin-off group Arcadia, this, this album sees the instrumentalist and percussionist employing jazz, funk, and Asian rhythms. Now, I got this album during my new age phase back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and I had no idea who David Van Tegum was when I bought it, but it, it's a really cool album. I, it's really come to be, be a a bit of a favorite of, of mine amongst my new age albums and it's yeah it's, it's kind of has a world music feel toward to it uh, kind of like you know I was saying he employs a lot of uh, Asian rhythms uh, you know uh, from around the world it's, it's a really cool album uh, check it out if you like experimenting with uh, instrumental stuff that's kind of world music or, or new age jazz avant-garde jazz maybe give it a try 
A quarter of a century ago, Men at Work frontman Colin Hay released his fourth solo album, Topanga. Now you've heard me talk about Colin Hay a few times on this channel. He's one of my absolute favorites of all time. And this is one of his best albums, honestly. Uh, it's got some of his best songs on it. Uh, Waiting for My Real Life to Begin, that's a fantastic song. That's one of his best of all time. I Think I Know is a great ballad. Uh, the Lost Generation is a fantastic song. Oh, what else? What else? Uh, Road to Mandalay is another f great one. I mean, if you want to get an introduction to Colin Hay, this just might be the album to go with. Uh, it's just a, f a fantastic one. I mean, you know, it's it's not a noteworthy album in terms of backtracks, but for me personally, for, for my own personal backtracks, it's a major album. So go check out Colin Hay. I, I've probably urged you a few times to do that, but yeah. Check him out, definitely. He's, he's not to be missed. Also released in December of 1994 was Bush's debut album, 16 Stone. It peaked at number four on the Billboard 200 chart and in Canada, number two in New Zealand, and number five in Australia. All five of the album's singles, Everything's In, Little Things, Come Down, Glycerine, and Machine Head, reached the top five of the Canadian Alternative Songs chart and the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart. Come Down and Glycerine not only reached number one on the latter chart, but also peaked in the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Released during the last month of the 90s was DMX's third album, And Then There Was X. It debuted at the top of the Billboard Hip Hop Albums chart and the Billboard 200, making DMX the first hip hop artist to have their first three albums enter the Billboard 200 chart at number one. It was also DMX's best-selling album to date, with a five times platinum certification in the US. All three singles peaked in the top 20 of the Billboard R&B and Hip Hop singles charts, and Party Up, Up In Here was his most successful single of his career, as well as his second and thus far last single to break the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Also released in the last month of the 20th century was Mandy Moore's debut album, So Real. It peaked at number 31 on the Billboard 200 and was certified gold within a month of release and platinum just two months later. The lead-off single, Candy, just missed the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100, but hit number 27 on the Billboard Pop Singles chart, and was also a top 10 hit in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and a top 20 single in France. Walk Me Home also reached the top 40 of the Billboard Pop Singles chart, and the title track was a top 40 hit in Australia and New Zealand. Happy 15th anniversary this month to John Legend's debut album, Get Lifted. It peaked at number 4 on the Billboard 200, number 1 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart, and also reached number 1 in Norway, number 2 in Sweden, and number 5 in the Netherlands. The album earned Legend three Grammy Awards, including Best New Artist, Best R&B Album, and Best Male R&B Vocal Performance for the single Ordinary People, which reached number 4 on the UK Singles Chart and the Billboard R&B Singles Chart, and was a top 40 hit on the Billboard Hot 100. Other singles on the album include Number 1, featuring Kanye West, and So High, featuring Lauryn Hill. Also released in December 2004 was K.T. Tunstall's debut album, Eye to the Telescope. It peaked at number two in Tunstall's native Scotland, number three on the UK album charts, and number four in Ireland. It was a top ten album in Canada, New Zealand, and Finland, and reached number 33 in the US. Lead-off single, Black Horse and the Cherry Tree, was a top 20 hit in the US and went top 40 in the UK. Suddenly I See spent ten weeks in the UK top 40, peaking at number 12, and just missed the US top 20, reaching number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100. Both singles were top 40 in Ireland and New Zealand. Turning 10 years old this month is Chris Brown's third album, Graffiti. It became his third consecutive top 10 debut on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 7. It reached number 40 on the Australian and New Zealand album charts and number 55 in the UK. Two singles were released from the album. I Can Transform Ya, featuring Lil Wayne and Swizz Beats, made the top 20 on the Billboard Hot 100 and the top 10 of the Billboard R&B singles charts, but follow-up single Crawl didn't quite reach the top 40 of either chart. Both singles were top 40 hits in the UK and top 20 hits in New Zealand. Also released in December of 2009 was This Is War, the third album by 30 Seconds to Mars. It peaked in the top five of the Billboard Alternative Albums and Rock Albums charts, and at number 18 of the Billboard 200 as well as the Australian Albums chart. It was a top 20 album in the UK and Germany, and a top 10 album in New Zealand and Austria. Singles Kings and Queens and the title track topped the Billboard Alternative Songs chart, and both reached number four on the Billboard Rock Songs chart. Kings and Queens and the third single, Closer to the Edge, both went top 40 in Austria, Germany, and New Zealand, and top 10 in Portugal. In December of 2014, Walk the Moon released their third album, Talking is Hard. It topped the Billboard Alternative Albums chart and peaked at number 14 on the Billboard 200, and was a top 40 album in Canada and Scotland. It achieved platinum certification by the RIAA in December of 2018. 
it was propelled by the huge success of the lead single Shut Up and Dance, which topped the US and Canadian adult contemporary singles charts and was a top 10 hit in at least 10 countries. The follow-up single Different Colors went top 10 on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart and Work This Body went top 40. Also released five years ago this month was Nicki Minaj's third album, The Pink Print. It peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 and holds double platinum certification in the US. It landed in the top 10 of the Norwegian, Canadian, Taiwanese, and Swedish album charts. It received a Grammy nomination for Best Rap Album, and Rolling Stone named it the third best rap album of 2014 and the 60th best album of the decade. First single, Pills and Potions, hit the top 10 of the Billboard R&B and Rap Singles charts and the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up singles, Anaconda and Only, both topped the Billboard Rap and R&B singles charts, with Anaconda reaching number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and only landing in the top 40. Pills and Potions and Anaconda both went top 20 in Australia and New Zealand. Okay, now it is time for the Spotlight album, the final Spotlight album of 2019. And yes, you'll notice I use the singular form of that word, album. Uh, I, I know December is supposed to be the month of generosity, a month of giving. Uh, I'm supposed to be giving you more, you know, with what with you know Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, I don't know if they give gifts, gifts at Kwanzaa, but you know, Boxing Day for you folks up in Canada, and all that other stuff, you know, the general goodwill toward human stuff. Uh, but contrary to that, I am dialing it back uh, for a few reasons. Well, one reason is my voice is starting to die out here. Um, it takes me forever to film these backtracks things, just with all the, the flubs and the false takes and false starts and all that stuff. Um, but also because, uh, well, my wallet's a little bit thin this month, so... Uh, you know, I, if, what with uh, I wanted to budget for my Portland trip last month, and uh, you know, also all the all the expenses that we had this year, which I won't bore you, bore you with mentioning again. But and yeah, we're at home here. We are uh, doing a very low key, low budget Christmas this year, just because of all that stuff. Uh, and also, you know, hey, I gave you guys, with the exception of just one other month this year, I gave you guys two spotlight albums every month on Backtracks. And in fact, uh, at least two. One month I gave you three, and another month I gave you four. So. Hey, cut me some slack here, okay? Uh, you know, I, I did want to um, do a higher profile album than this, since I'm only doing one. I wanted to do uh, Let It Bleed by the Rolling Stones, but unfortunately, you know, with the wallet being a little thin, the only copy that I found of that was new, and it was pretty well up there in terms of price. So, uh, yeah, I was left with just one album, and it's a, a not only a more modestly priced album, that's much more to the point, but also a modestly, modestly profile album. Uh, but hey, it's still, it was actually still a very good album. Uh, it turns uh, 35 years old this month. It was released in December of 1984. It is the eighth album by the Alan Parsons Project called Vulture Culture. And this is a great album. Uh, I, my only exposure to the Alan Parsons Project up till now was their hit singles, as has been most uh, the case with most Spotlight albums, as was my whole point for doing this feature in the first place. Uh, yeah, uh, Eye in the Sky was their biggest hit, obviously, and uh, one or two others that I should have had written down but have escaped me, of course, now that I'm in front of the camera. So, uh, but yeah, for some reason I was expecting something different than what I got with this album. It's not to say that it was bad. It's just, uh, you know, I was expecting a little bit more proggy stuff because uh, APP has a uh, lesser reputation, but still a bit of a reputation for being a kind of a prog rock band, not nearly to the level that, you know, Rush and Styx and ELP and those guys are, but they do have some prog leanings on some of their albums, from what I understand. Uh, but yeah, this was actually not not really proggy at all. The songs are very, you know, neatly separated into, uh, you know, different uh, separate tracks, and, you know, they don't carry over, not that I could see anyway, a real narrative, an album album-long narrative. So, you know, it's it's pretty accessible in that way. But yeah, this is just uh, synth rock type of stuff. I get hints of Super Tramp and maybe some ELO sort of stuff in here. Uh, but there's also uh, there are also hints of Beach Boys, ironically enough. And uh, yeah, the, this album has it. The album has eight tracks on it. One of them is instrumental. So the other seven tracks on here, uh, the lead vocal duties are uh, split between five vocalists. So that yeah that. Uh, to me is is only a good thing it, it really shakes up the album it mixes it up a little makes it uh, gives it a little more variety but uh, Eric Wolfson who is actually one of the uh, founding members of uh, APP he sings lead vocals on two or three of the songs but anyway all the songs that he sings vocal on 
remind me a lot of the Beach Boys. There's just that the sunny sort of Beach Boys ish harmonies. So those songs really stand out. Um, I should have written down what those songs were. Uh, Hawkeye is the instrumental on the album that I was talking about. That's really good, and it uh, employs saxophone, as do a few of the song, uh, songs on here. Uh, Let's Talk About Love was a great one. Um, Sooner or Later, that, that's actually one of the songs that Eric Wolfson is on. I remember that one. And then uh, I think Somebody Out There is another one that's uh, Eric Wolfson, Wolfson sings. But, I mean, hey, there's not a bad song on this album. This is uh, really, really good. It's one of my more favorite uh, Backtrack Spotlight album uh, experiences this year. Was, uh, yeah, not was, was not what I expected, uh, but in a good way. Uh, so, yeah, Vulture Culture by The Alan Parsons Project is a very, very good album. Uh, I highly recommend it. I'm, I'm glad I'm adding it to my collection, and I will probably go exploring the project's uh, other uh, albums and the rest of their discography. So. so that'll do it for Backtracks for December of 2019. Yay, my voice made it all the way through, just barely. But uh, anyway, and uh, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.